Hi, this is George Alger with another segment of Our Ventura. And today I'm speaking with David Atkins, who is an audio technician. And we're going to be talking about a kind of cool piece of recording apparatus from a long time ago. Welcome, David. Hi, it's nice to be here. So, David, let's get right into this. What is this? What is it called? And what can you tell us about it? Well, this is a uh, Presto K8 record cutting machine. This particular machine was built in 1938. Um, this machine is a portable machine, as big as it is um, and as heavy as it is. Um, they, it is a smaller machine than what would have been used in the studios uh, for cutting records. Um, people use this type of machine to go out into the world and record uh, field recordings. Okay. Um, you might use it uh, at a church or you might use it at a school um, or you might uh, like there was a gentleman that worked uh, for the Library of Congress that uh, went out with, one of, with a machine like this uh, in the trunk of a car. And he literally drove out to people's homes and out into small towns to town halls and would find local talent, uh, folk singers and blues singers. And uh, they would record for him uh, right there sitting next to the back of this car, so I've been told. Um, there's some, you can find some pictures of this on the internet. Uh, and there's a large collection of discs that uh, belong to the Library of Congress, and there's, uh, I believe, some of them can already be listened to online, but this project, I believe, is still under, underway to digitally transfer these original um, one-copy-only recordings um, so that they can be uh, listened to and enjoyed by the world. Great. Well, I know we're going to see how this works in just a moment, but... I wanted to ask you, because I know that you record with much more modern and more portable equipment, and, um, but what attracted you to this old equipment? Well, there's something very, very interesting about recordings recorded on a record to me, but even when I was a child, of course, records and tape is what we had. Right. And records always fascinated me for whatever reason. I can't explain that, but um, the, uh, the whole process of how this works, um, I'm sure there are a lot of young people out there that have no idea of how you would cut a groove into a record and have sound in it. But this device um, takes sound from your voice or from a musical instrument. Um, it enters into a microphone, and the, the diaphragm of the microphone is moving back and forth with the sound, just like waves in a pool. And those exact motions are transferred to a stylus cutting tip that is, uh, well, it's probably very hard to see on camera, but there's a tip here that carves into the record and it moves back and forth exactly the way the sound is hitting the microphone. And then when you play it back with the playback head, it is now moving back and it is reamplified through a speaker. So there's nothing digital about this. It's all analog. And would it be safe to say that this is sort of like the opposite of that? In other words, it's got a needle and this is how you play and, and then it really is just... Essentially, cutting. yeah. I mean, they, they work the same way, just backwards. Wow. Just that one has a cutting stylus and is much heavier than the other and the other is a playback. But it's, it's, it's they're pretty much, yeah, pretty much the opposite of one another in that respect. All right, so, so. do you want to... Uh, Give us a go. Yeah, um, I'm sorry to say I don't have an original microphone to go with this thing. I have a, a modern microphone, but I thought it would be fun to try recording just our voices on this thing. Let me see here. Check, 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 check. The way this works, and, and I like to record from the outside, uh, excuse me, from the inside out, huh. because as this thing cuts, it throws out a lot of debris, and the debris migrates to the center. Mm. And there's probably... Um, you shot some video of me using this machine um, at a local establishment where I was recording a band with it, and I tried recording from the outside in, and I had to chase this debris with a brush, and it's a big hassle. And if the debris gets in the way of the stylus, it can damage it. So it's just easier to record from the inside out. Obviously, you can do it either way, then. Yes, yeah, so there's a little, a little uh, gearing device underneath the platter that you can switch to make it go from one way to the other. So we just we lower the arm down. Okay, now it's cutting. And um, anyways... Test, test, hello, test one, two. This is a test of the Presto K8 record cutting machine. Here, go ahead and try that. And you can see the debris coming off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I, piling up. So, it, this is, um, so you got a VU meter right here. Yeah. And you can adjust the volume there. And what other controls do you have on this? You have a tone control here, and we're using, we have this thing custom wired to an RIAA curve, which is, which is actually a more modern playback curve, so that when people play these records back on modern equipment, um, it'll be properly EQ'd. 
Um, other than that, the machine's totally stock. Anyway, so let me go ahead and lift this off. All right, now once you're done recording one of these records, you of course have this pile of debris on it that you have to get rid of. So that's the, the cuttings from the, yeah. is, is it vinyl? It is actually, I think the acetate or lacquer is probably the more appropriate thing to call this. Okay. Um, anyways, let's see here. So you disconnect the microphone? And yeah, it actually switches it over to uh, playback. Okay. There we go. And obviously it was just gravity that's holding that down. So, I mean, is there much of an adjustment that you have to make other yes, than that? Yes, there, there is a spring here, which is, a, which is like a counterweight to it. So the, so the head is, is actually being partially supported so you don't push too far into the record. Okay. But it is an adjustment that has to be made. Now, let's see here. Like now, there's, there's plenty of space that hasn't been recorded. Can you still use that Oh, space? yes, absolutely. Okay. And this record has some recordings already on it. Um, the record blanks, which are still available, are very expensive. There is a, uh, there is a company that, that creates these, and they sell them right over the Internet. Um, so I have a stack of blanks that I got through the mail. But uh, they, with shipping and everything, come to about $16, $17 a disc. Okay. And on this machine, now... These are the same discs that would be used in a recording studio today. They are still making uh, the LP. The LP meaning long play. Long play was something that came in, in uh, the 50, well, actually, I think the late 40s, early 50s. Um, this machine is cutting with the disc spinning at 78 RPM. Mm. The 78 RPM became a standard sometime, I believe, in the early 20s. And the groove size wasn't standardized until sometime around that, too. I'm not going to say I'm absolutely totally accurate on the dates. But, okay. but this is what was referred to as standard groove. And the LP is micro groove. And the LP is one third the size of the cutter on this. So that coupled with the fact that the disc is turning with much faster speed, there's literally only about four minutes and 30 seconds worth of space on a 12 inch disc. So at, at 16 bucks a pop, you want to make sure you're getting something worthwhile. And once, okay. once a recording was made, would it be appropriate to call it a master? Yes. And this really isn't the material that you would use if you were going to mass produce, although you can. This record, if it were going to be mass produced, would be taken from the machine without ever being played. That would be the first thing. You would never want to play it because you'll damage it with the oh. first playing. It's a very fragile material. Um, you would send it right off to a mastering house. They plate the record. They make a negative with the plating, and then from the negative, they, they go through several phases, but the bottom line is, is they make a stamper, which is an exact negative of this thing. They put material in it, they press it with a lot of heat, and um, just like making a tortilla in a press, if you will, it presses out, and when you lift it out, you've got a positive again that has the exact identical grooves as the original, and you can make thousands of them from a stamping process. And this is all stuff you can see on the internet if you look on there, how a record's made. There's a lot of very interesting videos online available that shows this whole process, something that uh, is very much fallen by the wayside, but is still happening to okay. some degree. Anyways, let's just try this real quick. All righty. Let's see if this is going to work today. I have to try to remember how this works. Oh, excuse yeah, me. this isn't part of your daily tool. <laughs> no, this is not something that I use on a regular basis. <laughs> There we go. Test, test, hello, test wow. one, two. This is a test of the Presto K8 record cutting machine. Wow. And you can see we have our, this is the playback oh, yeah. lid, the speakers oh, yeah. in the lid. So it, this is, um, so you got a VU meter right here, and you can adjust the volume there. And what other controls do you have on this? You have a tone control here. We're using the same custom wired to an RID curve, which is which is actually a more modern playback curve, so that when people play these records back on modern equipment, um, it'll be anyways. That gives you an idea properly. It records the human voice amazingly well. Yes. And if you're recording something like a human voice and a guitar, the, the, uh, an acoustic guitar, the results are really very phenomenal. That's great. So it, it's very very fun to take it out and to demonstrate it. Um, I have a lot of other plans in the works for it, but uh, they're still down the road. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit more about the history of it and the application of it. Were there, do you happen to know if there were a lot of these machines made or there was only a handful? I think there was a lot of these machines made, and, um, but I, I don't think there's a whole lot of them that have survived. Um, these machines became you know, very obsolete and like so many things um, 
have just been ignored away. You know, they would have gotten, ended up in garages and storage places and stuff. And then, of course, humidity and, and uh, you know, moisture and, and just neglect, they would get rusty and start having all sorts of problems. And, and the electronics in these things would start to fail over time. This machine has been completely gone through and completely rebuilt. I don't know if you got any video of this thing recording down at the restaurant or not, but, uh, or any of the playback of it. I don't know if you were there when we played it back. That recording came out extremely well. Yeah. Um, we did a live recording at a local restaurant of a band, and uh, as part of the show, when the show was over, we played the record back, and the results were very good, and um, it was a very, very exciting evening. Yeah, I think this is a fascinating piece of equipment. Do you know what was the, um, what was the technology that eclipsed this, the technology that came right after this? Well, the compact disc is really what killed it, although, although tape was, was really trying to take its toll on records. Um, when people were suddenly able to play tapes in the car and were able to play tape in their home, um, I think there was a certain amount of convenience factor about that that appealed. But uh, really, the compact disc really, really took its toll on the LP. It was smaller, it was easier to store, you could play it in the car. You could play it in a little unit that you could carry around. But even it's becoming extinct now right. because of downloadable music uh, is making the CD very unpopular amongst young people. And, and young people have always driven the industry to a large degree. Um, certainly in the, in the 50s, uh, young people were a humongous market for rock and roll and rhythm and blues. And, uh, and that whole thing had a huge influence on where radio went. And, uh, you know, so yeah, this this technology is just really falling by the wayside. But there's something extremely interesting about seeing it out there. Oh yeah, well, in fact, I mean, your passion and, and love for the technology comes through when, you know, for instance, when I saw you using this at that restaurant and that um, and rec you know, doing a live recording there for the uh, patrons to hear of the band that was playing. Do you do that routinely? That was the second time I've taken the machine out and done that. So routinely, no, not really. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of work to take it out and to set it up and to do stuff with it. Um, and it's something we've only incorporated, like I said, into two shows. Um, I borrowed this machine from a gentleman down in Culver City, and he's the fellow that re restored it. His name is Len Horowitz, if you don't mind my saying so. Yeah. Um, and he's associated with the history of recorded sound. Ah, OK. Um, he has a fascinating collection of machines and equipment. And um, he loaned me this machine specifically because there was an artist coming to play who was playing stuff that was in a 50s style. And I thought it would be really fun to cut a record of him right there at the restaurant. And uh, just for my collection, I, I collect records. I have a very large collection of, of vintage recordings going clear back to the turn of the last century. And I wanted to uh, have some records that I'd cut myself in the collection. And so I, I went down there, and he very graciously loaned me this machine. Um, this machine uh, has been very, very lovingly restored. I, you'll notice how shiny all the pieces are. All of these shiny pieces on it are all chromed. They've all been meticulously removed and sent out and re-chromed, and every facet of the machine has been rebuilt. There's another thing that's interesting about this particular machine. Um, this machine on the underside of the turntable has a strobe set up on it that's for time code. Oh. So because he wants to use this machine for sound for 16 millimeter film. So he wants to shoot 16 millimeter film and this machine with that strobe will be driving the speed of the camera. And then when it's played back, this machine will drive the speed of the projector so it's a lot of synchronized sound. Wow. So um, he does all sorts of really neat stuff with it. So that's another thing that this is going to be doing soon. Nice. Well, David, we're out of time here, but um, maybe we could fit in two points. Can you actually show us the size of this? Can you pick up the record so we can? Oh, see sure, the sure. This this is a 12 inch. This is a 12 inch disc. Okay. And um, this is a, this is a new a new disc. But I brought along um, this is an original set of audio disc uh, blanks. These are probably from the 50s with their original sleeves. These are unused original blanks. Um, they are showing their age. This one right here, this is a silver tone blank. This was made by uh, Sears. Um, back in the day, you could buy a home version of this, which was a little more primitive. Um, and they didn't work terribly well, but, but they worked well enough. People would make recordings of their kids and uh, just whatever they wanted to do. Uh, also, during the war, people recorded their voice and sent them home to their loved ones. And, uh, Great. 
Well, if someone uh, were interested in learning more about this or contacting you to find out more, how could someone get in touch with you? Well, I don't have a website, but I am the audio engineer for the First United Methodist Church on Santa Clara Street, and I'm pretty much there every Sunday running the soundboard. So you can always find me there. Um, beyond that, I'm just around. Okay. <laughs> all right. I do all sorts of stuff around town with audio and, uh, and uh, film. Okay, great. So. Well, David, thank you very much for taking the time to come in and, and show us the, um, the equipment here. Oh, you're very welcome. It all was right. a real pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. This is George Alger signing off for this segment of Our Ventura, and until we see you again, take care. <laughs>